So basically what Sal Khan is saying in this book is that we are going to move to a flipped classroom model. So who here, I mean, does everyone understand what flipped classroom is at this point? <coughs> Soon, yes. But if you don't know what flipped classroom is, it's basically a pedagogical method where instead of having your class and your lecture in the classroom environment, mm -hmm. the students will do work previous to class. And then when you get to class, you do a more, much more discussion-based class. So it's much more experiential learning than it is that traditional lecture format. So as we move more into this AI environment, I think that you're going to start seeing your educators want what's called a fixed, or I'm sorry, a flipped classroom. And whenever we think about flipped classroom, that translates into an active learning classroom, right? So does anyone here design an active learning classroom or is most active learning mean you got tables around the room, mobile furniture, right? That becomes a little hard for us because there's this thing called power. <laughs> That's what you need. But we're going to talk a little bit about how we can design towards that flipped classroom model and how do we move in towards, towards a classroom environment, whether it be physical in the room or remotely or virtual, that leads the student's ability to learn in this new way. And so just for everyone's, you know, you might want to do a little bit of research on Khan Academy, but basically what Khan Academy does, it is 4K through 12 now, moving into higher education, but it's a personalized AI bot that doesn't tell the students the answer, but they guide them through that knowledge transfer, and it acts as a tutor. So how can we think about the way Khan Academy is leveraging AI and think about it, how do we leverage AI in our classrooms to make the student experience better? So flipping the model, right? Um, democratization and personalization of learning. So this is the way we're gonna be designing classrooms. And this is a screenshot of how we designed our classrooms when I was with the medical school. We had three different campuses that were collectively in one classroom environment. And we were connecting through a tool called um, C1D Multi-Site. But this is the active learning classroom that is gonna be the future of our classrooms. So you're gonna have basically students learning in groups. So no longer are we in a traditional format for the way we learn. We're gonna have students learning in groups, having discussion, and then being able to interact back and forth with their instructor. And the instructor can be in the room, the instructor can be at a campus nearby or remote. And then how are we utilizing AI tutoring to prepare for these class discussions? So AI and universal design, we all know this, right? We all know that incorporating tools like Microsoft Teams or Zoom or whatever you're using, we now have the capabilities of using AI transcription. Has anybody used Copilot inside of Microsoft Teams yet? You have to pay an additional license. Any thoughts so far? Everybody's really like that. I think, I think that's my thought so far on it. I think so far, right now, as I, we did at Marshall University, we did a pilot with faculty, research, researchers, students, um, administrative offices, and basically the two things that came away is from Copilot with Microsoft is I like how it summarized my email, and then the second one is I like the AI transcription because that does democratize the meeting for people. It gives you the takeaways. Like, I mean, how many of us have multitasked during, during a meeting and then we come back and say, what did that person just say? So that's the beauty of how that can apply to our students, right? <coughs> so can, if everyone can go back to when you were students at one point in time, how much would you have given to be able to go back to the transcription and the AI summaries to be able to learn better or to have a better student experience? So I, I really want everyone to start thinking about how we might utilize these tools in our classrooms to make it a better experience for students. Um, inclusive avatars, teaching personalities, and this is, I mean, pick, pick who you want to be your teacher today, right? I mean, it's still the instructor. The, the instructor is still the bedrock of the education. They're the content expert. But would it make someone feel more comfortable to have someone that might look a little bit more like them teaching them? So we have to start thinking about how we might utilize av avatars, AI, to make people more inclined to learn ultra-realistic text-to-speech, so otherwise, right? Like, if I need somebody to, to speak that text to me, being able to use AI to do it in a tone that's familiar to me, or, you know, a certain 
language or dialect, and having those capabilities for our students. Uh, language transition and study guides using AI summaries of course materials. If you were, if you were a student and had all of these tools, do, don't you think you'd be a little bit better of a student if you think back to where you were? Now think about the, the opportunities these students have and we have all of these things, but how many people are actually using these things to help enhance the experience for our students? Can I see a show of hands? Very little. So, no wonder we have enrollment problems. No wonder we have retention problems. Because are we even using any tools to help make the experience better for our students? Right? And how many, how many people can truly say that their faculty understand that they, these tools are available, or would they use them? Do we have any thoughts in the room? I, I am a discussion person, so I would love to hear just some thoughts about this. Would they use them is the real critical part, because we have a classroom that, we, we have a building that was built in 2017, there's an active classroom that was designed and nobody uses it that way. The instructors walked in the door and said, where's my instructor station, where's my PC, how come I can't, and now my task when I go back home is to convert that to a regular classroom. Yeah. How many people are having very similar, similar experiences? Something I can tell you these guys know very well. Where's my whiteboard? Yeah. How many people hear that? We heard that, we were building a building, and I think we heard the words, where are my whiteboards? At least, I don't know, 100 times? Mm -hmm. Here, I can use the catch box too if you need me to like throw it. Okay. these things and and you're I think everyone's gonna love my next slide I think that this just says more of what exactly I was just trying to get up so our job as technologists is to integrate the room with technology right that's our job but it's not not anymore now we have to be trainers now we have to be business operational efficiency uh, process analysts so these are all things that I just want everyone to think about. And this is this this slide I'm going to tell on Marshall University, and let me tell you, even getting on this slide is this next slide. Um, this stresses me out. <laughs> these are all the ways that we can deliver a class, right? But why isn't there just one way to deliver a class? Like it's so easy. We have the technology in place. Like why do we need to code that we have all of these different ways? To, to do a class, but in general, we're just going to do it in person because that's what that's what we're doing, right? So that's what we need to do better of as technologists is to how do we communicate all of these things that we can do for our students and bring technology to the table when we're having these conversations with faculty in order to say we only need to have one. And we can do it all of these which ways, but we need your buy-in from an administrative standpoint and a faculty standpoint to get us there, right? So keeping pace with technology, and, and you know, I have a lot of thoughts about this because I, about a year ago, finished my dissertation on this, and I, this is what I did it in, right? So lack of adoption in hybrid and high-flex course design. So in order for a mixed modality strategy to work, you basically have to have your course design. You have to have teaching best practices. You have to have the infrastructure. And then you also have to have the technology. I think we got the infrastructure and the technology mostly figured out. It's just how do we translate that into a conversation with our faculty to want to learn it in our administration? Because I, I honestly believe our administration is supportive. They just are also trying to work with our faculty to get them excited about teaching in a different way. And then on the administrative standpoint, are we providing the training and the best practices to, to teachers in order for them to do this? Because I will guarantee you, we heard the whiteboard conversation and we kept doing it anyways. We kept not providing them anyways. And I will tell you, for the most part, Ryan here and my friends here in the audience can tell you, for the most part, they're coming along. We're getting them to come along. But it's sort of having to be that bad person in the room that says, 
This is not good for your students to have whiteboards, especially your remote students, if, if you have remote students. So what can we do better as, as AV IT folks? Um, engage our faculty in shared technology decision making. I will tell you, this is, this is my hardest, this is the hardest thing, right? It, does anybody in the room feel like they're doing shared technology decision making well at your university? I'm gonna pick on you because I want to hear all the things you're doing at some point because you keep raising your hand. What is going as well when it's the same thing every day? Same conversation. Yes. Unless it's a specialized department, right? Yes. Medicine and visualization or something. But what is going as well? What is doing it well, right? And that's a, that's a really good question. I guess my answer to that is, is do you feel like that shared technology decision making is being feel like a partnership there, or do you feel like it's them telling you what to do, or you telling them what to do? struggle with is because like we did the new building it's it's also like as an expert I know I'm a technology person however I have done a lot of research in the way that you build your classrooms for the greatest student engagement but then trying to tell somebody that is an academic you know how to build your classroom whenever you have yourself not taught before it is a hard conversation so how do we get there in a shared way right and then implementing a robust academic and classroom technology training program. That is something I think that we do not do well. I think that all of us in technology are putting out fires most of the day that we are not being as proactive as we need to be. So that's something that in, at Washington University, that's something that we are gonna be implementing is, is a more robust, more proactive way that we can help train people. And you know, a lot of times I hear, like, why should I build a room that has this much capability when they're only going to be using just a little bit? And my answer to that is, is we can always cater to the little bit, but I hate to tell somebody no that wants to use all of this too. And our students want to actually use that because it's a better experience. And then pilot and prototyping, I think that that's always a good strategy before you move forward. That's certainly helped us kind of get people more in line with what we're doing and some of the things we're doing. And then don't assume faculty won't use the technology. I think that's another, that's a lesson that's learned that we had is we, we had so many conversations about how much people didn't want to use it, but it was largely from the same person who was generalizing a response from all faculty. And we know that that's not, that's not always the case, right? So these are just some, and then how can we engage in AI? So that, if I can tell you one thing from this discussion is that as we think about equitable, inclusive learning, think about it for all of our students. Think about making it better for everyone. And how do we, how do we engage in these things and provide opportunities for people to learn and give them ways? Because a lot, I don't know about you all, but I get very overwhelmed with AI and what's available with AI. So I think it's really important that we give them ideas on how they might use it and then let them run with it, right? So let them prototype things, let them pilot things. Doesn't mean that you're gonna have to scale it. I think sometimes as technologists, we get very afraid that if I give somebody an inch, they're gonna take a mile. But I think there's a way that we can partner with everyone in order to get to that place. So I would just, you know, like I said before, this, this I really wanted to be a discussion. Because largely what I'm feeling is that people don't wanna have this hybrid conversation anymore. They want to go back to in-classroom, they want to talk about that, and they don't want to talk about, we know Hyflex is only going to work for course level. You can't, I'm sorry, I mean, you just, it's very difficult to scale Hyflex. We tried this at Marshall University, we tried to pilot, and largely what happens is, in a Hyflex model, people will come to the first two classes and then go to the Hyflex online course, async, the a, online asynchronous model by the time they're done. So they're not even showing up for any sort of class. They're just doing everything online. 
after a couple weeks. So I think it's very difficult to, to scale high flex, but I think it is very, very easy to scale hybrid. So what I would love to know is what lessons learned have you all been experienced? What are you trying to do to enable hybrid at your universities and any lessons learned um, to share with the group? Anybody want to, let me get my cash box here, but does anybody want to start off? I think I always learn better when we actually talk during these sessions, so I'm going to try to not get your head while I throw this thing. Ready? Oh, this is scary. There you go. Um, so one of the things, I guess, lesson learned, but also kind of a interesting thing that I've noticed at our institution um, and a fight that I've had with faculty is the fact that they want to, they don't want to go the hybrid route inside the classroom, but for all of their meetings and all of their things, they want hybrid every single option. And so one of the big pushbacks that I make, because I do a lot of the scheduling for their meetings is, I'm not going to offer you a hybrid option if you're not going to offer it in your classroom. And I kind of hold it like hostage to them yeah, yeah. for their own meetings. And it's really, it, it's eye-opening to see them be like, well, but, 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 and I'm like, so why don't you give it to your students? If this is an accommodation that you want for yourself, we have, as you mentioned, all the infrastructure. We have everything there available for them. And so, it's a difficult conversation to have. And I know, you know, that's something I've been trying to have more and more with the administration as well. But we need to have it with them and to say, like, you need to give this option. Do you feel like you get the, oh, or do you feel like you get the, well, like the excuse? I think both, right? Yes. Yeah. The, the aha hits a lot of, like, our younger faculty that are just like, oh, I hadn't thought of it that way. <laughs> And I feel like our older, more seasoned, you know, I've been teaching off a chalkboard for 35 years, don't take my chalkboard away, people, yeah. because we have those. Yeah. I had one faculty member who yelled at me for removing a chalkboard and putting up a whiteboard. Yeah. <laughs> Feels so familiar. <laughs> um, but it's there, my academic freedom to use my chalkboard. <laughs> the ones that I feel like push back the most on that hybrid model not realizing all the things they're missing. Yeah. The, the AI transcription, the ability to even just see the board better for some students. Yeah. Um, you know, and giving those, again, those accommodations to be available for students. And I know I think we're in a really interesting, or in my institution we have a professor who's in a very interesting position, very successfully high flight. Um, he, te or he just retired this last year. He taught every course for the last three years high flex. And he found that he had more attendance in the classroom than virtually. Really? Because students after, his, his classes were very discussion based. Mm -hmm. And his students found out that when they were virtual, they were less engaged. Yeah. And they felt they were missing parts of the class. Yeah. But he still gave them the 100% option to be fully virtual if they want it. Wow. You should do a case study on we, uh, He actually did with uh, our partner, with our video lecture capture partner, Echo360. Oh, I think um, everybody would be interested in that if we could like, figure out how to get that information and provide it to everybody in the group. So, yeah. I might have Ryan get that detail and maybe we can email it out to the group. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it was very interesting what he, like how he approached it and what he did to really that. leverage the high like side. And what institution? Uh, Illinois College awesome. in Jacksonville, Illinois. Great, thank you for sharing that. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> what, do we have any other, any, uh, right there, or can we throw it? There we go. Oh, this is fun. So, I've heard you describe a situation where classes will end up when they actually transition towards a more online modality, from high flex to the course of the semester. We've heard a story where the opposite can happen. In my mind, it seems like both of those situations kind of undermine the case for high flex. If you're, you're going to start high flex and it actually ends up not being high flex, mm -hmm. why do we think that's happening? Well, and I think, and I like, 
that's exactly sort of where I was going with it. It's like, for if I'm a faculty member, right, this is my opinion, this is my opinion. If I'm a faculty member, and if I have to prepare for a synchronous class, that's one way to prepare for a class. If I have to prepare for an online asynchronous class, that's a different way to prepare. So for me, I'm just like, I'm either gonna have an online course or I'm gonna have a synchronous course. I'm not gonna try to blend all of that into one because that makes more work for me. And I think that's typical. Especially if students are gonna veer towards one way or the other anyways. So that's just the way I think. I mean, I still feel like, I like the idea of high flex if you offer it I guess it's not really true to high flex, but I like the idea of offering multiple modalities, not necessarily high flex, just offering multiple modalities to your students so that if they want to come synchronously, they can, but if they want to do it on online asynchronous, they can. And just having that sort of ability for students to have some sort of preference. Like I'm much more of a proponent of if I'm a student and I can't make it to class that day, that I can join remotely to that class. Honestly, that's the only way I would have ever got my PhD. You know, I've got a family at home, I've got a full-time job, there's no way that I'm able to go to go sit in a class. So I definitely think for non-traditional students it's important to have some sort of preference in there. It may not be high flex, but at least have some sort of modality preference, ability. I don't know if that answered your question, but at least that's an opinion about it. Go ahead. Um, one of the things that I think that um, the lessons that I've been trying to teach in my institution is everybody's forgotten what it's like to teach in this methodology from the late 90s. We had two way video conferencing. Our institution said, We're going to demolish the room because we're going to never do this ever again. <laughs> they were only about 20 years off before they were declared wrong completely. We, we went through the pandemic with a declaration that there is no high flex that will be designed on this campus. Six months later, construction project almost done, permits all expiring. What can we do to deploy high flex? <laughs> and the biggest takeaway I have is there's a lot of spaces you can adapt. There's a lot of spaces you can't. And we wound up making some bad decisions adapting 200 seat auditoriums for it. And it works to an extent, but it doesn't work for a lot of the small group learning that's really required in these kind of, in these kind of methods. Yeah. yeah, that's a really good comment. And that's, that's something that we're grappling with at Washington University too, is we have 100 classrooms. Which of the 100 do we invest in? But if you're gonna invest in all this technology, you have to have the faculty that sign up to allow for it, right? That's what I keep saying. It's just like, let's, I'm not wasting money doing this until we, well, we have to have the money first, but that's a whole other, I think we all get that. But I'm not gonna put a bunch of money investing in these classrooms when we don't have the faculty that are ready and willing. Or is it one of those chicken and the egg syndromes where it's like, you will build it and they will come. So we're sort of trying to roll them in the middle. You know, we're not we're not going all in yet, but we are making sure that when we have faculty that are interested in doing something different, that we can accommodate their needs. And sort of that's sort of our strategy going forward. I'm going to put one more comment out there, and this is my personal opinion. My boss will probably disagree with me. It's your I boss feel, already? No. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I feel that our faculty, my institution, are very mercenary and don't want to participate in pilot projects or anything else unless there's some compensation involved. I do not get a single dollar of CARES money during the pandemic. I think that gentleman right in front of you wanted to. So her quote is kind of similar to what this gentleman was saying about the faculty and the, getting and being at stipends for them. Uh, I think some of the lessons that we learned was that not all classrooms or classes require high flex. And so we've seen a lot of, you know, for instance, general ed courses that may not need high flex, but the ones that do 
So years ago, we had a professor that actually taught AI and did an experiment. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was previously said that <clears throat> the, the AI tutor was actually the preferred tutor for the class. And they did not know that, there was, that this was an AI tutor. <laughs> so students preferred to be artificial intelligence. intelligence. Now, I want to go back to um, the hybrid. It was our experience that the faculty that is good at teaching and that loves teaching and that loves instructing, they embraced hybrid. The faculty that just was teaching because that was part of their contract and they would rather do research, they did not embrace it as much. Yeah. You're always going to have the ones that will and the ones that won't. So, the way that I think about, I would love to know your all's thoughts about how we might incorporate AI into our classroom design. When I say classroom, I'm thinking physical and virtual, right? When you think about it as a particular environment. But how we might use AI to sort of help us get past these faculty 
sort of misconceptions of AI, or I'm sorry, of hybrid learning, right? So could we incorporate AI engagement factors for our students to understand, like, if I'm gonna run a report on my team or Zoom of who jumped on the call, how do I, how do I use AI to say how they engage during the call and give them a score of engagement during the call or something like that? Like, how might we use AI in our classroom environments to help promote allowing more hybrid modality or allow more flexible modalities into our classroom environment? Does anybody have any thoughts? Or is that a question that you're sort of like, oh, yeah, I don't know about that way. Go ahead. Institution and you act like yeah. 
<laughs> you're not acting like a 21st century institution. So I, I think you said that you did, but how many of you in here use pilots with certain faculty members to try to get them to sort of do your use case and then you can explore? Like you said, get a, get a pilot with one, have one try it, and then they start having a conversation and then you get more on board that way too. And I think that's a really great way. I feel like we don't do that enough. Like we have to do that more in order to get people more engaged with, with what's going on. Like with so. virtual reality. In yeah. Reality classes. Right. That's a great way. I want to ask this gentleman in the back. He was doing a lot, a lot of, we do all of this already. We're so good at it. I need to hear what your thoughts are because I would love to hear what the things, the strategies that you all are doing. Um, well, do we have the catch? -up? Like, can we get close? Oh, good. Wow. <laughs> To start our, so I work for a medical school um, where all either distance ed or hybrid. So there's there's that. But mainly what we're working on integrating right now is the AI. And I'd say a third of our faculty are interested in trying it in some way. Our biggest hurdle is HIPAA compliance and vetting the data security of those large language models through our ISO. So our adoption is very, very, very small because okay. of those restrictions. And if we had access to them, I'm relatively sure we would be deploying them in as many different ways as possible. So are these these AI tools that you're not necessarily contracted with that people want to use but can't from an integration security perspective? Yeah. Um, a pilot, for example. We're seeing a lot of our AI and a lot of our meetings, things like that. And I think that's a whole other conversation from the student perspective, because then you get faculty that don't want students using our AI or team's AI because they feel like that's infringing on their copyrights of their material in the class. So how do we bring all of this together into a conversation where it's like leveraging the technology and letting faculty understand or guiding them to some sort of comfort level to allow, because AI is not going away, and these students need to learn how to incorporate AI into their learning. So how do we, how do we bridge that gap? Does anybody have any ideas? I think, and I, you probably came to the session thinking I was gonna give you a great idea. <laughs> um, but I think it is, go ahead. We actually do have a small list of tools. Uh, we have a list of tools that, that we consider approved mm -hmm. for our students to use. Not, assuming they're not actively engaged in research or uh, HIPAA, then they can use these tools and we have a list of them that's constantly evolving and changing by the right. means. And I think that goes back to the conversation about making sure you do your pilots. Because if you don't do that, you will never get started. And you can't be at a place where you don't get started with some of this stuff. You at least have to get to that point. So I think. The moral of the story is today is that, you know, as we think about AI, incorporating it into your classroom environment, please, please keep moving. Even though people want to keep telling you to not go there or they don't need that technology, we need to keep thinking about what our students need and what's going to make a better experience for our students. So let's keep going, keep pushing the barriers with your faculty, with yourselves. It's really easy to get discouraged. As technologists, um, and is there anything that anybody's watching right now? Like, is there anything that anyone feels like is the up and coming thing for for hybrid, high flex classroom learning that we want to share with everyone? We're looking at uh, hologram. Hologram. Okay, that's great. Are you and for your medical schools? No, uh, just for anything. Yeah, uh, for anybody to uh, really test uh, hologram. Okay. Scotty, is that what you're working on? Yeah. I love that. Yeah, just mentioned in our class, we have a pilot going on with um, faculty that have recorded in the classroom, taking all the transcripts and recording them in the chat box. There you go. So the check is allowed for access to students to ask questions, that kind of thing. Awesome. Very cool. Anybody else have anything? Up here in the front? Watch your hand. Close your drinks. We're testing this thing out. Pretty solid. I think 
celebrate. Uh, why did I spend all that money on ceiling lights? <laughs> so at our institution, I mean, you know, fiber is a thing for sure, but you can't put all your eggs in that basket. So we're really trying to target specific classrooms, right? Because you're going to spend a lot of money to equip that classroom properly. So one of the things we have been looking at, and I'm really interested to see what happens this year, is systems that can have a track and have a switch cameras. So you are creating a better experience for those students that are going to be going. So it's exciting because, you know, to do it obviously you can have a production team in the classroom or, or like you said, having a, a student here operating the system or a faculty, a, a staff member, a PA or whatever operating the system. There's challenges with that because, you know, it costs money to have people on the clock doing jobs. So I'm really interested to see if that AI technology get to the point where you can have a production level fiber experience, that's just out of there. Yeah. Yeah. Gentlemen, very second. So we, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm at a small university in North Carolina, part of the UNC system, right? And when you say the UNC part, you would think like, oh, look, it's going to be all great, right? So I'm at the, a small university with less than 10,000 students. What you're talking about was a uh, plan that I did seven years ago. I'm up on my eighth year now. I was the guy who was one of the students who produced the do it around to all the classrooms and produced the classrooms, right? So we had this really great CIO who came in and said, hey, uh, let's standardize and put a piece <coughs> of the hybrid room in every classroom. Well, she retired or left, and part of that went away. But the part that we did went really well, and I found out that I went too small, right? So um, I gave them a piece of it, but not all of it. What I mean by a piece, I didn't put uh, the camera all the way around the room. This is the first time we've done this. We did forward facing camera using the Cisco technology. And um, I went from 13 poly rooms to probably 50. Cisco rooms around campus. And now, since I hate getting into vendors, but to me, that is a better experience in the classroom because a lot of the software has AI already built in to that stuff, and it has really worked really well for me. So now I'm at the point of seven years, it's time for a refresh. And where do I go from here? You know what I'm saying? So I, we're not rich, but money is not the, the hot topic. So I need some help trying to figure out where to go, where do I prepare for the next seven years because my CIO is pushing AI heavy, right? But what part of that is faculty is not, you know, all the way in. And that's, that's honestly where I feel a lot of struggle as a CIO because I know that our president is pushing AI. We're not moving fast enough. But then I know also it's like you, you sort of like have to like get the dream versus I was just talking about this, you know, like the whole Pinterest, this is Pinterest versus reality. Like that's what I feel like I'm always sort of dealing with as, as the CIO is like, ooh, let's do this. And then like you want to just show them the reality picture. So um, I know we've only got six minutes left. I want to thank you all. I understand that this is an investment of your time. I hope you took away some, some tidbits of information. Um, my thing that I always love about Infocom is the opportunity to have conversations. Uh, more than anything, and just sort of, and I'm happy to have further conversations. My contact information is right there. So if uh, anybody wants to chat or have further conversations, I'm always happy to do that. I have a lot of opinions about where we're going with AI and higher education. And um, all I can tell you is just start doing something after you get back from Infocom. If you're not, if you're not start starting with this, just start doing something with it because you don't want to be behind the curve as we move forward. So. Um, thank you again. Have the best time in Vegas. I will also say, come to my friend Ryan's session at one o'clock. He will show, he will tell you how to solve all of our problems with faculty. <laughs> so um, he is he was he was he did all of our faculty training in our in our brand new classrooms that we just what we just we just this past semester right spring semester we opened our building went live with all new technology that didn't include one whiteboard. So. He has a really great session. We'll probably be able to tell you lots more about that. Um, but thank you all. Have the best time. And it was nice to spend my, my day with you.
Thank you.